What's up, guys? It's great to be here with you guys, and thank you, Your Open Metaverse, for hosting me and having me. You guys are awesome. I'm already, I'm already excited by the friendships being cultivated and by the vision of what you guys are creating. For the rest of you that don't know my work, my name is Jason Silva. Uh, my background is as a television presenter. For many years, I hosted Brain Games on the National Geographic Channel, which was a show about the ways in which the brain perceives the world and the ways in which the brain often misperceives the world. And we had a lot of fun uh, exploiting those cognitive loopholes in that game. Uh, I also do a tremendous amount of speaking because I'm very passionate about disruptive technologies and the future of humanity. I'm very much an optimist. I try to see things through an optimistic framework without being Pollyanna about the, of course, existential risks that come with every new technology that both, it both extends but also amputates. But in the end, I, I tend to to veer towards optimism because I think there's enough doom and gloom in the world. And so to, to, to share my vision, the, the name of this presentation today is the reality of the virtual. Most of us are used to using the term virtual reality, which implies some kind of like artificiality to these virtualized spaces, these virtualized realms. Oh, it's not real, it's virtual reality. But when I first heard the term, the reality of the virtual, that spoke much more deeply to me about the felt experience of succumbing to these virtual worlds and these virtual realms. And these, these, the reality of the virtual is nothing new. When was the last time you lost yourself in a film? There's nothing virtual about that experience. There's nothing artificial about that experience. The moment the mind couples itself to the narrative, you assume the viewpoint of the character, you have an experience of suspension of disbelief, and you literally are now no longer in the default world, but you are very much in the reality of the virtual and the experiences that can happen within the reality of the virtual can be as meaningful if not more meaningful than what happens in the default world in fact often the default world is 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 impoverished in comparison in comparison to the deep meaningfulness of of what can happen in these virtualized realms read any piece of great literature another example of the reality of the virtual the speed and the and the intensity with which you can be transported with which you can be catapulted to realms beyond imagination realms that are ungoverned by space and time realms that are more akin to waking dreams than to the dreary and boring default world and the slow pace with which it moves with its drab quotidianism and the slow people mover that's carrying all of us towards death. We free ourselves from the human condition and the existential weight of finitude and mortality by the reality of the virtual. The reality of the virtual is human imagination exteriorized. It's human imagination uh, turned inside out. It's, it's, it's creativity turned inside out. And as D.H. Lawrence wrote, it's an example of how we free the brave, reckless gods that live inside of us. And so for me, this all begins with a passion for human creativity. At the end of the day, all these, these musings begin with just a passion for creativity and imagination. And this then turned into a passion for technology because I believe that technology is human imagination inside out. I believe that technology is human creativity literalized and exteriorized and concretized in the world. I believe that technology is how we impregnate the world with mind. And it has, in the, in the words of the cognitive philosophers David Chalmers and Andy Clark, technology is in fact a scaffolding of the mind, one that we use to extend our thoughts, our reach, and our vision in the world. And by the way, Beyond more contemporary expressions or manifestations of this, we, there is historical precedent for the way that we use our tools and technologies to extend our reach and transform our possibilities and move beyond our limitations. If you go back 
100,000 years, for example, to the savannas of Africa, when early hominids first picked up a stick on the ground and used that stick to reach a fruit that was on a really high tree branch. We've been using our tools, our sticks, our instruments to extend our reach and to transcend our limits, right? And we've been in the kind of symbiotic co-evolution between us and our tools again since the dawn of, of man, since the dawn of humankind. And so cut to the present day, right? We live in an age of massive disruption. We live in an age of massive transformation. We live in an age where it feels like the rug is being pulled from underneath our feet. We live in an age of a kind of vertigo. The pace of, of change is so overwhelming that people are in fact terrified of the future. The, the snowballing feeling of acceleration is giving us, again, a kind of nausea. And, and for many, the question is, is, is why, right? Like, like, why do things feel so overwhelming? Why do things feel so dizzying? Why do things feel so counterintuitive these days? And this has to do with the, the pace of technological change. Because the human brain thinks about change in a linear fashion. The human brain thinks about change over time linearly. That's how the brain is wired. The brain evolved in a world that was linear and that was local. But now we live in a world that is global and that is exponential. And so there's a cognitive dissonance between the way we intuitively think about change over time and <laughs> the change over time that we're experiencing in an exponential age, right? Linear intuitions meeting an exponential world. And so it's very important to explain to people the reason that all of these exotic technologies, things like, things like fully immersive virtual realities are arriving at the pace that they're arriving. And so there's a, a very simple example by uh, Ray Kurzweil. Ray Kurzweil is the head of engineering at Google. He was called by Bill Gates the smartest man alive at predicting the future. And he had this wonderful example to explain the difference between linear change and exponential change. It's called the 30 steps example, okay? So if you take 30 linear steps, one, two, three, four, five, by step 30, you get to 30. But if you take the same amount of steps exponentially, you get to a billion. So think about this as you sort of try to assimilate how far-fetched a lot of these ideas about these deeply immersive virtual realms and what becomes possible sound. Think about how far-fetched that sounds, but in the context of exponential change, realize that what seems far-fetched, in fact, is inevitable and is accelerating towards us like a freight train. So 30 linear steps gets you to 30. 30 exponential steps gets you to a billion. And that's the reason why the smartphone in your pocket today is a million times cheaper, a million times smaller, and a thousand times more powerful than what used to be a $60 million supercomputer that was half a building in size 40 years ago. So that's really the, the, the metaphor that I want you to hold in mind before I play the following video. The supercomputer that used to be half a building in size 40 years ago now fits in your pocket. And the supercomputer in your pocket is in fact a million times cheaper, a million times smaller, and a thousand times more powerful. And in the next 25 years, that supercomputer will probably shrink down to blood cell size devices in our bodies and brains where brain machine interfaces will allow us to tap into virtual realities indistinguishable from the real world. We're talking the matrix times a million uh, in ways that seem far-fetched but are in fact inevitable. So, to set up the context of what exponential change means for the future of humanity, let's play this first video called The Future of Us. So let's talk about the future of us. What does that even mean, the future of us? It's a look at what comes next. It's a look at what might be. Because today, exponentially emerging technologies are transforming what's possible. They are helping us overcome, transcend, even biological limitations. The very rules of what it is to be human are up for grabs. We're rewriting the software of life with biotechnology. We're turning matter into a programmable medium with nanotechnology. We're creating sentient minds with artificial intelligence that are not bound by the limitations of biology. These three overlapping revolutions, 
GNR, Genetic Nanotechnology and Robotics, together will be leveraged to lead us towards a black hole-like, impossible to fathom singularity. It's like staring into the sun. A moment of a rousing symphonic climax when all of mind leverage the network together transcends its biological origins and we become something more. People worry about the AIs and the them. Well, as Kurzweil says, that's gonna be us. The future of us is ours to dream up. Okay, so the, I, do, I do these videos to try to contextualize where we are right now. Like, I think that we, we, we can read articles in technology review and we can hear about things like the metaverse and we can hear about like billion dollar companies coming, emerging out of nowhere and billion dollar companies disappearing just as quickly and we can read reports about how society is changing or how social media is rewiring our brain. I mean, we can, we can read about the, all these things as abstractions and then go back to our regular lives. But I think sometimes what we need is for the story to be contextualized emotionally so that what seems like science fiction is in fact a mirror of the reality in which we're living in today. So when I talk about exponential change, I feel like that's like the interpretive frameworks or the lenses of perception that I feel like we need to deploy when we're trying to map the terrain that we're living through today. You know, companies like Your Open Metaverse are conceiving of us moving into spaces that are akin to waking dreams where we can spend more and more of our mind time problem solving and collaborating and entertaining each other and doing all kinds of things that sound in some ways beyond possible. Like really, like, like the matrix, you know, at first they look like rudimentary cartoons, but eventually the idea is that they will be as vivid as the greatest IMAX film you have seen, but as three-dimensionally immersive as that reality in which you dwell when you walk to the office every day and all moving increasingly at exponential speeds. So if you understand, first of all, Moore's law and the speed at which technology changes exponentially, that's number one. And number two, you also understand that virtual reality is not virtual or artificial at all, but in fact, it has real existential weight. It's the reality of the virtual, right? Even rudimentary books, even in the immersiveness of cinema has real weight and it can have real emotional impact and the vividness of a lived experience that is mediated by a virtual technology is just as real to us as our normal waking state. And so it's that intersection of exponential technologies and reframing what we think that is somehow artificial about virtual reality, because it's not artificial. It actually can be more real than real. It's actually hyper real. It's actually, in fact, you might say psychedelic. You know, one of my greatest phrase, my favorite phrases is that we're living in a cyberdelic age. Cyberdelics is the mixture of the word cybernetics and psychedelics, right? Cybernetics is, of course, systems thinking, computers, digital technology. And then psychedelics is... <laughs> describing psychedelic compounds, but the etymology of the word psychedelic means to manifest the mind. So you have cybernetics and you have increasingly a capacity to make manifest the mind by turning our virtual imaginings into actual things we can step into, which is the whole Terence McKenna notion of like moving into the imagination. Terence McKenna was a psychedelic philosopher who said the future of humanity is to step into the imagination, to move into the imagination. And so how do we convey that to people, right? This isn't just a bunch of nerds like playing War of Warcraft or something online. Like, no, these are vivid realms where we will be able to express ourselves in ways that are potentially more fulfilling than the meat space. You know, in the meat space, some people have very rich, deeply meaningful lives, you know, star athletes and and movie stars and, and successful artists. But for most people, oh no, for most people, for most, not you, you're gonna have a great life. For most people, for most people in the default world, as Dostoevsky said, most men lead lives of quiet desperation. 
right? Most people's genius, talent, creativity is thwarted by the limitations of the real world. Not enough opportunity, right? Not enough access, you know, no, not enough opportunity to fully realize oneself because of scarcity, because of economic inequality, because of geopolitical whatever, right? But people talk about Web3, people talk about how cryptocurrencies all of a sudden are giving banking to the bankless, you know, or people talk about how you can play to earn possibilities where kids in Indonesia can play video games and make money to help their village. I mean, that's just the beginning. Imagine then when imagination, doesn't matter where you're born, doesn't matter what your gender, doesn't matter what your race, doesn't matter what the opportunities you are given or not given in the world, here is a portal of infinite abundance where your own imagination could potentiate possibilities for you that are akin to freeing the brave, reckless gods that live inside of you. Now, this next clip I want to show you is, uh, is from a film from 1999 called Strange Days. And that's a film that was about a, a, an ability to record full sensory 3D virtual experiences and then sell them on the black market in the form of a playback. So the idea was that you could put on a thing, like let's say you were like an international sports star. You could put on this like neocortical recorder and then you could go like have the most amazing sex of your life and an orgy. And then that playback, instead of selling porno tapes, you could sell three-dimensional fully immersive ability to play back that experience. Anyway, this is a sound clip where the main character is selling, he's a salesman, he's trying to sell these tapes of like what it's, what it's like. But what I think is so, and so what I had, I had my editor take the audio, but then reanimate the visuals because I thought that's a very compelling sales pitch, but it doesn't have to be a sales pitch for like virtual reality porn. It can be actually a sales pitch for virtual reality possibilities in general, right? The metaverse fully realized might be sold to us like this. Have you ever jacked in? Have you ever wire tripped? No? A virgin brain. Well, we're gonna start you off right. This isn't like TV only better. This is life. Yeah, it's a piece of somebody's life. Pure and uncut. Straight from the cerebral cortex. You're there. You're doing it. Seeing it. Hearing it. Hearing it. You're feeling it. It's about the stuff that you can't have, right? Feeling the adrenaline pumping through your veins. I can make it happen. I can get you anything you want. You just have to talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. I am your priest. I am your shrink. I am your main connection to the switchboard of souls. I am the magic man. Santa Claus of the subconscious. You say it. You even think it. You yeah, have it. Are we beginning to see the possibilities here? You know you want it. Now, if that was the commercial for your open metaverse tomorrow, I'd sign up right away. You know what I mean? Um, so, so, so in any case, again, I feel like I've been talking about two different things, but I want to make sure that you guys are seeing where they intersect. Like, number one, there's nothing artificial. There's nothing inauthentic. There's nothing fundamentally unreal where it matters most, which is in the realm of lived experience of our subjectivity, right? A great story and a great film can have the same existential weight, can have the same reality as getting like punched in the face on the street. Like the reality of the virtual can have the same weight as the reality of the meat space. So that's number one. Number two, Virtual realities are technologies, and as such, they are governed by the exponential speed at which technology is changing. We all know this because we live in this exponentially disruptive age where, you know, viral pandemics are sidelining the planet, remote work becomes a thing overnight, new iPhones every six months that are twice as powerful as the old one. Like, we see the exponential speeds with all of its disruptions and turbulences, but also these exponential opportunities. Because... The scale of exponential change, again, means that the scale of exponential opportunity is on the same measure. And so, again, there's nothing artificial about virtual realities. So these metaverses are just as deeply meaningful for those that partake in their domains 
as the real world, quote unquote, and the metaverse is powered by exponential technologies, which now you understand how they work. The real world is not, at least until we fully digitize it. And so there's a lot more possibilities to be had in these realms of virtualized mind space than that world over there where people still get sick and die of cancer or get hit by cars, you know? Like, let's unleash our minds and our consciousness and let's go work together. Now, I have a video that I made about the metaverse. It's actually the first time we're showing it publicly. I did it actually after conversing with the gentleman uh, of your open metaverse and, 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 and a couple other conversations that I had with some thought leaders on the space. And so basically what, what they were talking about that was interesting to me is that here, here you have an exteriorized mind space. If you think of the metaphors as, as, as the mind exteriorized or a consciousness space where we can populate with our minds. But normally we're all living in our mind space alone. Or when we dream, when we dream our brain similarly, unconstrained by the laws of physics, when we dream, we, we run simulations, we try things out, our unconscious is working through problems and so on and so forth, but that's a, it's an isolated process. But you might think of the metaverse as a, as a dream that can be populated by many minds where we can run simulations and try things out and try new forms of governance and try new ways of interacting and perhaps have these avatars where we have either pseudonymity or we can try out new identities, try out new genders, try out new ways in which we want to be met by the world. You know, why should we be constrained by the genetics of what we were born with? Like, we like Halloween parties, you know? We like to put tattoos and clothing and ornaments to express our symbolic self on the outside. But on the metaverse, there's no limit to how our symbolic self can be exteriorized. So that's another thing that's very exciting about it. So then this video, I guess you, you could eventually call it a, a, a partnership video. Um, it's the first version, but, uh, but have a watch and, and then we'll do some Q&A. Okay, friends, so let's speak of the metaverse. Let us speak of human imagination exteriorized. Let us speak of a parallel universe that is summoning its own literalization, because that is what the metaverse is. It is a parallel universe that is summoning its own literalization. It is conceived first, of course, in the mind, in the imagination, these virtual realities. And then in combination with our modest looking thumbs was instantiated in the world and now lives in a substrate of ones and zeros. And so what's striking about the metaverse is that it is a collective imaginarium. It is human imagination exteriorized and one that can be paid visitation to by many minds at once. When we dream at night and go into the virtual reality inside of our mind, we do so alone. When we dream, we work through problems, we try things out, the laws of physics don't constrain us, we can take risks, the brain can play out all these simulations that can then prove useful in our normal waking states. But this creative problem solving in the dream world is an individual thing. With the metaverse, we're creating a dream world where all of us together can dream to the degree that we can try things out without constraint or limitation. We can experiment together with new forms of governance. We can try things out in a low friction environment, limited only by our imagination and by the unreal game engines that can render worlds instantly into being. In the metaverse, we can culturally together problem solve and design societies to meet the challenges of the 21st century. We can think and act 
exponentially at scale in this metaverse. Billions of us can experiment with new forms of governance, new forms of problem solving, new forms of making decisions, new forms of collaboration and cooperation, new kinds of economics, new kinds of tokenomics. We can create digital currency. We can practice decentralization. We can govern in a decentralized manner. We can cooperate and collaborate. We can compete and make new rules. We can rewrite the rules. We can play. We can play, which again does the same, serves the same function. Kids at play are trying things out, are stretching their minds, are running simulations. When we dream, when we play, and now together, where we experiment and problem solve in the metaverse. You know, Bob Keegan says, of course, the world has many problems. There are many there are many reasons to feel despair, but he had this great line. He said, you know, how about if we reframe this and we see a problem to be solved as a problem that can solve us. And so in the metaverse, all the problems to be solved can become problems that solve us because through the collective and creative problem solving of many minds together trying things out, we can change how we think and how we act in ways that can have a spillover a reality bleed through effect into the meat space, the Euclidean meat space in which we also dwell. And so in that sense, again, we're opening up a collective imaginal space, a collective imaginal space where all of us together can try things with a kind of courage and zero inertia, no friction, no boundaries. So. It is a game-changing revolution of the mind. It is a revolution for all of us. It is a revolution of society, of the man, of the human machine civilization. That's the potential of the metaverse. And so the question is, are you in? Are you in? Let's do this. So that's it, guys. I mean, I, I know I might sound a little bit like a hype man, but I'm trying to... I'm trying to like make people dream to aspire to the highest possible expression. It's totally possible that it just turns into another fucking Las Vegas slot machine dopamine hijacking whatever. We all know that. There's plenty of people writing about that. But if we pull through and we unleash its full potential, it could be it could be something like that. And uh, and, and so that that's that's what I that's what, that might as well put that out into the world. So thank you guys. Thank you.